welcome everybody to the Neuron Ghost Study Museum, an uh, international conference dedicated to the application of neuroscience to the visitor experience. My name is Alessandro Bruno. Um, I'm standing in for Professor Riccardo Manzotti, as unfortunately he was not feeling well. Uh, so I'm honored to standing in for, for him and I wish him all the best for a full recovery. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, one of the protagonists of today's event. Um, as today, I think it's a very important occasion for us to talk through uh, so many aspects pertaining to um, museums and the full around experience around it. Um, okay, Annalisa Banzi, I would like to I'll give you a microphone to talk about, to introduce yourself. Hello everybody, good afternoon. My name is Annalisa Banzi. I'm an art historian and I earn a PhD in psychology applied to museum studies. I am one of the organizers of this conference and I'm very pleased to be here with all of you. Thank you, Annalisa. Uh, I think that your, your work is, um, um, is amazing as uh, I'm a big support of uh, interdisciplinary projects and I guess that you paved the way to uh, so many considerations. So I think that today is the perfect you know, uh, time and place to talk about all these possible considerations. Uh, we have a very interesting, um, I would say, lots of well-reputed scientists uh, talking about, I will talk in a few minutes about several aspects. So today I think that one of the most important aspects is to uh, tackle the topic by looking at it under different perspectives. Um, I'm working on artificial intelligence, which is, uh, without further ado, is one of the most, I would say, one of the hottest topics uh, because of the disruptive uh, um, results achieved by generative AI. So we start off with a piece of text and we may achieve uh, images, uh, video sequences, and of course, there's a lot of study coming from uh, neuroscience. So I think that one of the aspects that we could also ask um, some of our um, guests is what, what is their view regarding uh, neuroscience and AI and how they can be combined in order to uh, improve or enhance uh, visitor experience in museums, uh, you know, just um, off of my head. Um, okay, so uh, of course we have uh, psychologists, philosophers, neuroscientists, and uh, I'm really happy and honored to be here. Um, I know that Ricardo uh, will talk about so many things uh, if he uh, were here. Um, I think that you know, neuros neurosciences is nowadays uh, one of the most interesting uh, disciplines as we can learn a lot from uh, human behavior and uh, you know i'm thinking about uh, one of my favorite topics uh, we talked about it late, uh, earlier on is visual attention and uh, you know there's a, of course there are correlations between neuroscience studies and the visual attention processes and i guess that we can use um, these studies to make uh, experience more interactive and uh, we were talking about you know attention span um, Providing that today we are overwhelmed with, uh, you know, so much information and thinking about the way we, you know, scroll up our, you know, smartphone screen. Uh, so we, it's kind of, we are uh, missing lots of information because we are, uh, our attention is drawn by some particular silent elements. So those elements in the picture uh, or in a given visual scene that mostly uh, catches our attention, uh, but by pursuing that kind of elements, we may uh, miss some other pieces of information, which are um, as important as the others. So one of the um, one of the questions I would like to ask is about uh, how can we enhance or improve visitor experience in museums, which are very complex environments in this regard. Uh, maybe we can just have a quick chat, an informal chat, before, you know, diving into um, the scheduled, um, um, the scheduled um, speech from um, 
from speakers. That's all right? Would, how would you feel in this regard? Uh, how can you describe, if, if, I would like to ask uh, your opinion about it. How can we, for example, focus on some uh, particular elements in a gallery or in a museum? Is there, a, is there any uh, tools that we can use? Or um, sometimes we relate museum as a kind of uh, um, old fashioned environments. But I think that as we go along with uh, uh, the topics we were talking about, you know, neuroscience, uh, uh, psychology, uh, computer science, um, I'm not mentioning it by chance because I'm a computer scientist. Um, so, yeah, I would like to uh, ask you this question. What's your opinion about it? Well, it is a tall order to answer this question because it's, it's a very tricky one. Um, I think we can take advantage of the, the numerous uh, findings collected up to now by neuroscience and psychology. And I think the idea to be here today is to discuss this, uh, this possibility and uh, my idea uh, is to carry out experiments uh, which can give us more information uh, regarding this topic because it's a very difficult situation. We know that uh, our attention uh, is uh, cached by many different stuff so we have to understand how we can uh, guide our attention. So at the present moment, I do not have a lot of answers, but I have uh, many questions. <laughs> yes, yeah, so th thank you. I think that we all have uh, several questions because the, uh, the topic is so uh, complex and compelling at the same time. Um, for instance, I, I experienced some um, tools um, that, was, that were reliant on head movement so from the moment you are close to a screen, uh, I was working on touchless interfaces. And from the moment you are the one that is closest, the closest one to a screen, you have a multi-layered architecture enabling some layers contain, containing information. And uh, by the time you start moving your head, so you have a kind of a on-screen head movement projection. And if you dwell over a certain threshold uh, of, you know, time range, you can explore information, you can explore contents, because that means that you're interested in it. Uh, of course, the, one of the very first questions I would like to uh, maybe, uh, you know, get into is um, how can we, you know, break it down into neuroscientific terms? Which processes are involved when we explore contents? Um, my curiosity is because I, I've explored the first three seconds of observation in an environment and uh, findings reveal that uh, if you gather lots and lots of experiments from people looking at images, um, and though we are all different, we have different preferences, we have different tastes in art, uh, music or whatever content we may refer to, um, well, if you gather lots and lots of data, uh, we will notice that there are some blobs in images that can be overlaid with them, indicating what regions are the most important from a perceptual viewpoint. And that goes under the name of a silency map. That's quite helpful um, to determine whether a region of an image is actually of interest to the viewers. But of course, we are entailing uh, to the f we are per that's pertaining to the first three seconds. So uh, there are some study studies revealing that over the first 100 milliseconds, we have the so-called early visual attention processes, meaning that we have the so-called chessboard effect. So you have a pattern of uh, elementary pieces, so uh, black and white, black and white squares. All of a sudden, one of them turns red. That is something that drags our attention uh, simultaneously all of a sudden because a single piece of elements that we have, a piece of image, becomes an area of interest. Why is that so? Because of uh, um, the bottom-up process. When I think of bottom-up, it's something you know, coming out of the blue to catch our attention. Uh, if we go beyond the first uh, 200, 300 milliseconds, some other processes come into play. Uh, they are called 
top-down processes. For instance, we are very much interested in looking at faces, which is not a very uh, elementary instance. Uh, faces, how can we determine or define faces? Um, there are some specific shapes, boundaries, and of course we have uh, a triangle, eyes and mouth. We are interested in catching this triangle to establish eye contact and communication. So computer science in this regard, of course I will let neuroscientists talk about it. I'm so interested in knowing their opinions. Uh, we tend to imitate um, human behavior and uh, the human vision system behavior over the first three seconds. What I'm interested in knowing and you know unveiling is what happens if we go beyond uh, uh, the first three times, the first three seconds of observation, which you know entail other, and maybe I'm pretty sure to say that, more complex um, processes. Um, well, you know, I'm talking quite a lot, uh, but you know, I'm very patient about uh, this uh, topic. Um, and uh, there are also some other studies regarding the detection of scan path. So when you look at images or paintings, um, you have uh, some specific eye movement that lets you go through the most important regions. So let's say you have a Van Gogh uh, painting. There are some regions that may catch your attention. So a way to uh, represent, graphically depict the way you behave, the way you catch those elements is to detect the scan path. So we have a saccadic movement and we have a scan path. Think of a scan path as a sort of, uh, you know, some uh, lines connecting um, those blobs. So getting back to silency maps, silency maps are blobs kind of clouds overlaid with image and depicting the most important regions. Something which is a bit more fuzzy, fuzzier than scan path, which is a collection of lines. Um, okay, so I would say that now we could maybe have our first uh, guest. Um, yes, I think that is the right time. So I was given uh, 15 minutes. I hope that I didn't uh, bore you way too much. Uh, it's my honor to uh, welcome uh, Professor Michael Isenk uh, from the University of London, Royal Alway. Um, Professor Isenk? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Is, are you online? Yes, can you, can you hear me? No? Hello? So, oh, Professor can you, Isaac, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. So, so it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of uh, uh, Ulm University. Uh, professor Isaac is a British academic psychologist, emeritus professor of psychology at Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, of course, your fame precedes you. So uh, maybe you don't need a presentation, actually. Uh, so I will leave the floor. The floor is yours. And we are keen to uh, listen to your, your, uh, your speech. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, two, two of the things that you've just said, I, I would to totally agree with. One, one is that the, the issues that we're discussing here uh, are definitely very complex uh, issues. And I think it, it's very difficult to make generalizations in this area because there are big individual differences. And a lot of those individual differences, because you, you referred to top-down processes, a lot of those individual differences relate to individual differences in the amount of knowledge that people possess uh, about uh, art or whatever the subject of a museum exhibition might be, uh, and, uh, and also down to individual differences in personality. So that, that, uh, that makes the whole matter uh, complicated. And I guess, in a sense, the uh, in my mind, what is perhaps the, the, the single central issue here uh, is that I guess many of us have a suspicion uh, that when most visitors to a museum uh, go around a museum, uh, they spend 30 seconds or perhaps less than 30 seconds looking at each of the paintings or each of the uh, objects uh, and perhaps 
quite a lot of their processing is 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 fairly superficial. Uh, that they're, they're not engaging any deep engagement uh, with the material that they're uh, looking at. So that that's the aspect of this that I'm going to be focusing uh, on. Is are there ways in which we can try and get visitors to museums to be more actively engaged in thinking about uh, what they're uh, looking at. A, a background theory of some relevance that's become important within psychology is Friston's approach of predictive coding, uh, where the idea is that we, we spend our time, uh, we have a mental model of the world and we spend our time uh, hoping that our predictions about the world are going to be uh, fulfilled uh, by what happens uh, to us. Okay, so in other words, we're trying to minimize prediction errors by accurately predicting what the future is going to hold. And I suspect many visitors to uh, museum exhibitions, uh, their predictions are satisfied. They go and see some paintings by Monet, they know he's an impressionist painting, they know he uses bright colors, uh, and that he focuses on landscapes. And so all, all these assumptions are amply fulfilled by the exhibition and maybe they don't carry things uh, much uh, beyond that. Uh, and so really, in a sense, their knowledge about uh, art has, has not been changed very much as a result of their experience. On the other hand, if we try and arrange things so that uh, museum visitors uh, it, it have uh, thoughts which are unexpected and uh, unpredicted, uh, then they're more likely to engage in elaborate processing of uh, what they're looking at. Uh, this, as when a, a painting appears to be novel, surprising or distinctive. Uh, and if people do engage in this deeper or more elaborate processing, uh, then you'd expect that they would remember more of, of their visit to the museum. OK, so how are we going to uh, how are we going to achieve this goal? I think just before I go any further, I know that neuroscience is of central importance in what we're talking about here this afternoon. Uh, and I certainly accept that neuroscience is important, but I may differ from uh, some others uh, involved in this conference uh, because my strong opinion from having reviewed a lot of the literature on neuroscience is that neuroscience has proved really incredibly useful in terms of testing pre-existing theories, but uh, it has not proved nearly as useful in terms of generating new ideas and new hypotheses uh, in the first place. So my view is that in this particular area, we need to focus on developing some new ideas and theories first of all, uh, and then neuroscience can uh, provide ample uh, evidence to prove or disprove uh, these uh, theories. Okay, I've done some, I, I'm not an ex you, you already realize I'm not an expert in this area at all. Uh, one of the things that I missed <coughs> in, the, in the bit of reading that I've done is it seems to me the first order of business is to find out what exactly museum visitors, what exactly their thoughts are when they're looking at paintings or other uh, works of art. Uh, maybe there's a lot of research on this, but I, I'm unaware of it. So if, if the evidence doesn't exist, what I would recommend as a starting point is asking museum visitors to, to think out loud as they're looking at a painting or other uh, object uh, so that we get a, a strong sense of exactly what the typical museum experience uh, is. Uh, so that would be the, the first point. Then one approach has been taken to try and en en enrich the museum experience uh, is to provide more detailed descriptions of paintings when people are, are, are going around a, uh, an art gallery. And there's a recent study by Castellotti et al, uh, just, just published uh, this year, where they found that if they provided detailed information about each work of art, uh, that the visitors to the museum uh, had enhanced uh, understanding uh, of the material, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, however, uh, providing additional information did not lead to any increased interest in, uh, in what they were looking at or appreciation of the art. 
Uh, as I've already indicated, I think what is absolutely crucial and probably hasn't been looked at enough is <coughs> that we need to distinguish between a sort of passive acceptance of information that is provided to someone in a museum on the one hand uh, and their active uh, engagement on the other hand. So how, how can we promote uh, enhanced uh, active uh, engagement in, in what's going on? Okay, um, in, my, uh, in my opinion, uh, perhaps the central way in which we can do this is by challenging uh, viewers' uh, assumptions. And the limited reading I've done in this area, there doesn't seem to be much of a focus uh, of, uh, of attention. So here I'll give you a few examples. These, in fact, are largely based upon my own experience when I thought about me going to art exhibitions and so on and what I've got from them. OK, so this notion that if we challenge people's initial assumptions of artwork, uh, that this uh, will lead to an enhanced experience and also better long term memory about uh, the new learning that they have encountered. We can do this, I think, even with world famous paintings. Uh, everyone, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with Mona Lisa's enigmatic uh, smile, and that's been regarded as uh, completely mysterious. Uh, but psychologi psychologists have discovered uh, that uh, you, you can actually uh, explain what is going on here. If you look at Mona Lisa's mouth, uh, she doesn't appear to be smiling. But if you look, if you look at her face uh, more in peripheral vision, uh, then she does appear to be smiling. So, in other words, if if you're processing fine detail about her, her, her mouth, the shape of her mouth and so on, uh, that doesn't look like a smile. But if you've got more limited information about her mouth from peripheral vision, then it looks as if she is smiling. OK, so this is a, a world class, a world famous painting that everyone thinks they know everything about. And there's a, a new angle on it that perhaps uh, would, would be memorable. Okay, and a second example is Munch's uh, famous painting, The Scream, where I think the typical assumption is uh, that uh, people think that what this does is it all, all it does is reflect the inner turmoil of the central figure uh, in, in the painting. Uh, however, it looks as if it's a bit more complicated than that because uh, the views differ, uh, but uh, the figure, the central figure, has uh, has his or her uh, hands o over her ears, uh, and uh, this is to uh, in order to to prevent hear hearing what's going on in the uh, in the environment around her. And in fact, Monk's sister was actually uh, incarcerated in a, in a mental asylum uh, quite close to where that painting. Uh, was made. So Monks the Scream is probably a complex mixture of reflecting the inner turmoil of the central character, uh, but also their attempt to block out uh, and prevent hearing what's going on in the environment uh, about them. So here, here there's two examples where assumptions have been uh, broken. And here's, here's another one, sort of favourite. Uh, Cezanne is probably my, my favourite painter. And I was reading a book about Cezanne uh, recently. Uh, and of course, I think it's generally it's generally agreed uh, that uh, Cezanne is a is a, a incredibly important historical figure in the history of art because he more or less bridged the gap between realistic art on the one hand and abstract art on the other hand. Uh, and uh, I think I and most other people have assumed that the main way he did it was by having the shapes in his paintings sort of looking somewhat realistic and somewhat abstract at the same time. OK, but I saw this book and it had two paintings of Cezanne, an earlier paint, a landscape painting and a later landscape painting. Uh, and the difference between the two was quite marked, as it pointed out in the book. Uh, and that is that uh, if we just backtrack a little bit, uh, if you've got an abstract painting, everything looks two dimensional. If you've got a realistic landscape painting, uh, it looks three dimensional. Uh, and so uh, I'd always assumed that Cezanne's landscape looked more or less three dimensional. Uh, but when you look at some of his later landscape paintings, they look more like what I would call two and a half dimensional. So somehow in terms of 
two-dimensional rather versus three-dimensional, Cezanne has somehow managed to achieve the miracle of getting somewhere in between the two, uh, so that there's some illusion of distance, but but uh, but not very much. And again, that's, uh, I don't claim to be a huge expert on Cezanne, but I had certainly never thought about how uh, Cezanne had uh, manipulated uh, the impression of distance in his paintings to achieve some of the goals uh, that uh, he was after. Okay, and then a, a, another example showing how valuable it can be if you contrast uh, different paintings against each other. Uh, in, was it, 2000, 2009, there was a very interesting exhibition of Tur Turner's paintings uh, in London. And the essence of this exhibition was uh, you had paired together uh, sort of uh, original paintings by famous artists uh, and Turner's sort of take on those paintings. So he used the original painting uh, as the basis for his painting. Uh, and what emerged for me, which I had not thought of before, uh, is that uh, while his landscapes uh, and seascapes uh, seem, typically seemed a lot better than those of previous famous artists, painting similar things. When it came to portraiture, uh, he didn't seem nearly as successful. The, uh, the brilliant artists who were specialised in portraits uh, previously, uh, their work seemed more impressive uh, than his did. So this, this was a sort of a learning experience uh, for me. OK, well, my time is nearly up, so I just want to sort of summarise just the, the key points that I've tried to make. First of all, I think uh, we all tend perhaps to make glib assumptions about, oh, the average visitor to a museum uh, has these thoughts about what they're looking at and so on. So I think it would be really, really useful to have empirical evidence about what people actually do think when they're confronted by paintings or other works of art. Uh, and then my strongest recommendation is if we want to enhance the museum experience, it's really important to get people thinking deeply about what they're looking at uh, and stimulating active engagement with the works they're looking at by posing questions to them, uh, by giving them conflicts between the assumptions they enter the museum with uh, and uh, additional knowledge that doesn't is not consistent uh, with what they started off with. Uh, and so on. The, these are the way to go. And the, the third point that I mentioned in passing is neuroscience would be really useful when we have some more specific theories about what might be going on here. Uh, but I see neuroscience as being something that's going to become increasingly important uh, downstream when we develop more of a sound empirical and theoretical understanding uh, of what is involved in the visitor experience in museums. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Isenk. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I, you know, we'd like to ask you lots of questions, but maybe we could have uh, some more time after the um, second speaker, um, researcher Antonio Charasa from CNR, the Italian National Research Council, uh, who deals with translational neuroscience, a uh, new sector characterized by transfer of knowledge produced by basic sciences into clinical and social, social, social practice. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to uh, Dr. Antonio Cerasa. Uh, thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Could you see my entire screen now? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot for, for this invitation. It's a very um, uh, excited for me to be um, to be here. And my, my task today, my my, my presentation is um, focused on uh, uh, on to present you a different point of view about what is the neuroscience. Take a look to this video. I hope this will work. I was beginning to analyze something that we knew very little about. We knew that he was forgetting everything from moment to moment, but we didn't know anything else. So I said to him, I want you to remember the number 584. And then I had a cup of coffee with Dr. Spelbo's secretary, whom I cannot picture now. And 20 minutes later, I went back into the office and I said, now, do you remember the number? And I expected him to look at me blankly. And he said, 584. 
I was really absolutely astonished. I was extremely naive in those days, but we all were. I said, well, that's very good. How did you do it? Well, he said, you see, five, eight, and four, that adds up to 17. Divide by two, you get eight and nine. Nine, you divide nine by two, you have five and four. There you have it. You see, five, eight, four. It's simple. And then I said, and do you remember my name? No, I'm sorry. You see, I have trouble with my memory. And I said, oh, I'm Dr. Milner, and I come from Canada. And then he says how he remembers milking a cow in Canada once. And I said, and do you still remember the number? Number? Was there a number? I now invite Dr. Brenda Milner to say a few words. Dr. Milner. After all these years and many, many years here at McGill, I'm still teaching. And I find, first of all, that I'm grateful to fate. Uh, if you find yourself the real temptation, the real excitement somewhere else, don't be afraid to change. La vie est longue. Bonne chance à tout le monde. Okay. Uh, around the 1950, in several award plays, uh, um, biologists, neurologists, physiologists, engineering, psychologists start to think uh, with the idea that uh, we need a new way to study this more, the more complex system of the human body, the brain. In Montreal, Brenda Miller and his, um, and the husband Peter Miller represent the perfect example of how neuroscience was born, how neuroscience worked, because Brenda was a clinical psychologist uh, working for the, the, the most famous neurosurgeon in, in the world, the wider Penfield. Brenda, thanks to, Pen, to Penfield patients, thanks to uh, the opportunity to, to study the, uh, what, how brain change after, before and after uh, neurosurgical intervention, Brenda discovered the um, most important, the, the neural basis of, of several um, uh, mnemonic, uh, um, uh, mnemonic basis or mem mem uh, memory process. While Peter Miller, he, he, he was an um, engineering, thanks uh, to uh, the psychologist uh, James Old, discovered the reward system. This is the, uh, what is uh, neuroscience. Neuroscience is the opportunity to work together uh, with different professionals, with different uh, um, um, field of study, uh, merging biologists with, with psychology, merging engineering with uh, physics. And in this picture, you can see my, my, uh, my old friend, uh, Professor Tomaiolo, with Brenda. Francesco has been invited for celebrating this very important day, the, um, the, the, the Brenda birthday. The, um, um, the, she um, she, uh, she uh, has um, celebrated the 100 years. And during the, this party, Francesco asked Brenda to tell us the entire story of how neuroscience was born. And you can read part of, of this history on, uh, on our book. Okay, but the, um, formally, um, neuroscience was born in 1979 um, with, with the five specific areas, the neural system, the development, molecular, bi behavioral, and cellular. But years after years, decades after decades, neuroscience has grown constantly. And now this includes the knowledge from computer science, mathematics, physics, philosophy, and social science. When at the beginning, the the, uh, the aim of neuroscience that persists today is to advance understanding of, of nervous system and their role in behavior, to promote education in neuroscience, and to inform the, gen the most important aim, to inform the general public on results and implication of current research. What is neuroscience? Neuroscience is not a discipline. It is a way of thinking, 
way of thinking about the problem of brain. And then you use many neuroscience disciplines to attack the problem. So to use the singular, it gave really more of a concept of a, of a unified function uh, and not any particular neuroscience. But otherwise, they'd be a conglomerate of neuroscience, you know, ranging from, from behavior to computers to, to uh, neuropharmacology, neuros, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that, that was in the early days of thinking about things. As you heard, the neuroscience is not biology, is not uh, uh, psychology, is another discipline, another way of thinking about the problem. And indeed, Brenda said many times that neuroscientists should think in a three-dimensional space. But what does it mean thinking in three-dimensional space? To understand this uh, complex concept, and how we, we, we need to change our um, automatic uh, um, predisposition for, for thinking in two-dimensional space, in three-dimensional space, you can, we, we can make this joke. Uh, try to imagine the Orion constellation. If we, we watch the star from the Earth, we can see this uh, so famous constellation because we have a two-dimensional point of view. All people looking at the sky say, wow, this is the Orion belt. But this is not true. Indeed, now imagine to move at light speed and to reach the so-called Orion's belt. What we can see? Nothing. Just scattered stare in, in the universe. This is because we now adopt a three-dimensional point of view where we see the element around us using a new kind of perception, a new kind of, of ability. And this is uh, exactly what the basis, uh, the three-dimensional uh, mindset is the, the, the basis for a new kind of neuroscientist, the hybrid neuroscientist. <laughs> In 2010, Pep Guardiola changed the football, changes the way of thinking about, about football, about the rule of football, with the idea of Falso Nueve player. The Falso Nueve is not a striker, defender or playmaker. This is an hybrid player moving around the football pitch in order to reach directly the target. The target is to make a shoot on goal. The, the same con concept of hybrid player can be applied now, today, in neuroscience. It's exactly the three-dimensional point of view, the three-dimensional three approach of Brenda. The hybrid approach is the basis for a new area of neuroscience called translational ne neuroscience. Translational ne neuroscience is the best way to move from bench research, the basic neuroscience, to bedside application, passing from biology, engineering, psychology, psychiatry, and neurology. Because we need this new kind of neuroscientist. Because uh, as nature remember, the 90% of basic neuroscience, of basic research, did not uh, arrive on the bedside did not arrive in a new application for, for, treat, for the treatment of mental disorder. For this reason, we need a new kind of neuroscientist able to directly arrive on, on the target, passing from basic research to up directly to application. And what neuroscience can do? We can start from several places. We can start from the sezione aura, the golden section, the golden section denotes the irrational number 1.618, etc., etc., obtained by the ratio of two unequal lengths. 
And this, in this kind of ration can be uh, found in several natural elements and represent what we call beauty, what we call perfection. The, um, uh, God the, the God session can be found in, uh, in, uh, in several art uh, pictures, for example, and our brain recognizes directly if a specific opera, a specific arti uh, artistic picture is, is characterized or not by the perfect uh, um, uh, um, harmonization of proportion. And this kind of uh, research can be translated to promote beauty, to use beauty in art therapy, because it has been demonstrated that looking beauty improve, they reduce the level of cortisol, uh, reduce the, the, um, the, the stress, and uh, promote um, uh, well-being in, in all kinds of humans. This is a, a one example. Another example, do you know the fractal number? The fractal dimension is a term to provide a rational statistical index of complexity in nature. A fractal, park, uh, a fractal pattern changes, um, a fractal part change with the, the scale at which it, it is measured. In uh, the, the, cl the classical example is, is the broccoli. If you zoom on one part of broccoli, you can see a small part, a scaled version of the entire broccoli. And so if, if you, you continue to zoom, this, this condition will loop end, endlessly. This kind of uh, uh, mathematical um, uh, formula can be applied to, to, to represent, uh, to characterize uh, natural element, but also human brain. And this is the, 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 the part for, for um, this is the basis of the fractal geometry of brain, a new field of study um, started for, uh, by my friend Antonio Dieva, where, where Antonio uses a fractal number to characterize brain abnormality and to, um, in, uh, to, defini um, uh, to create new kind of neurosurgical intervention based on the complexity of brain uh, abnormality. Again, we can start from a skull. We, we, we can start to study archaeological artifacts, as done by uh, um, Herculano Usel, the most famous neuroarchaeologist. Um, this, uh, this colleague demonstrated that the ability of cooking has been the main factor influencing the skull size, boosting our brain, enlarging the number of neurons, the size, the weight of, of our brain. In other words, cooking influenced, has influenced the, the human evolution, allowing, allowing us to reach this new form of human. And speaking about cooking, we can also study chef. We can study chef, demonstrating that the chef are, are characterized by specific cognitive ability. And this cognitive ability are associated with brain plasticity, increased gray matter volume in the, the cerebellum. And this kind of uh, basic research can be employed for create a new kind of cognitive therapy based on um, uh, technical uh, task uh, during uh, cooking for rehabilitating, for recovering specific cognitive function in patients with lesion in the cerebellum. This does, I, I will conclude, what we can do with neuroscience. We can do everything because neuroscience is everything in, in, in every place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cerasa, for your presentation. I would give both our speakers a round of applause to thank them for uh, their wonderful and brilliant presentations. Thank you both. 
So it's almost 10 to uh, 3 p.m. We got some minutes to uh, for a question and answer session. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so you know, generally audience is a bit shy, so I'll uh, break the ice with some questions. Um, so regard, you know, there there are some interesting connections between the two uh, speakers' um, presentation. I was impressed, for example, um, by Professor Isaac's um, remark regarding, you know, 2.5 dimension. Uh, if we look at Cezanne uh, paintings. Um, so this um, observation uh, takes me down to a specific question. Can we perceive 2.5 dimensions as a sort of illusion? And can we use illusion in a sort of a, a sensorial journey to, let's say, engage with uh, visitors? Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure that that's uh, <coughs> exactly what I had in mind. Um, what I was, uh, <coughs> I suppose, really, in a sense, what I what I was saying was that the illusion, at least so far as I'm concerned, uh, the illusion was that I had, from looking at Cezanne's landscapes, I had imagined that he had fairly accurately captured th a three-dimensional. Uh, effect in, in the landscapes that he painted. Uh, it was it was only when I read this book that I realized that if you look closely at it, it looks sort of vaguely three-dimensional, but it, it certainly doesn't look entirely three-dimensional. Uh, and that's why I talk about two and a half dimensions. So I think the, the illusion is more that uh, my expectations and prior knowledge uh, over-influenced the way that I interpreted what Suzanne uh, had done. Thank you. So it, it was uh, was it something like uh, um, an effect that you had consciously after reading the book? Yeah, well, that's well, that's right. But also, in, in a way, almost for me, the main thing is, that, I mean, that this was about three or four years ago that I read this book. And that that is the thing from the entire book that I most remember sort of thinking, why on earth had it never occurred to me? Uh, the abstract paintings are necessarily two di are two dimensional and realistic paintings are three dimensional. So how on earth did uh, Cezanne deal with this issue that he was trying to combine elements of those two forms of art? Uh, and I say that that's that's really stuck in my memory uh, because it was so unexpected and something I hadn't thought about before. Sure, you know, it's, uh, I suppose that what that came out as uh, you know surprising. Uh, event. Yeah, well, that's right. And in ge in general, one of the big things in memory of uh, years ago, I did some research on it. Yeah, sort of things that are distinctive, novel, uh, surprising. Anything that falls into those sort of categories tends to be more memorable than things that are not surprising or uh, unexpected. Yeah, you know, uh, I was about to highlight this other aspect. You mentioned memorability. <laughs> And uh, what do you think about the, um, um, you know, the employment of memorability into, uh, for instance, the engagement with the visitors? Yeah, well, I, I think it's very important. Yeah, perhaps I didn't emphasize it enough uh, in what I was saying. Uh, so in essence, one of the key things I was trying to say was that for a lot of people who go to a museum, uh, and they just find that their expectations are confirmed. Oh, aren't these Monet paintings and sort of nice and colourful and very well executed and so on? Uh, they have they haven't actually learned anything new, so they've got nothing new uh, to remember. Uh, it's only when you're brought up short when you realise that the thoughts and beliefs that you have about an artist or a painting. Uh, it's only when you find they're being disconfirmed uh, that you engage in uh, in further thought. Uh, and, and, and then the results of that further thought uh, t tend to be highly memorable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the participants? Uh, can we hold hand over a microphone? 
Okay, so we have a question. Just a few seconds, and we'll be. Okay. Uh, so my question is for uh, Professor Eisnick as well, but it kind of links with uh, what also with the second um, uh, presentation we had. So I was thinking, uh, when we are thinking of delivering a museum experience which gives uh, more space for stimuli and for engagement for our participants, one way is definitely that of giving more information, uh, but if that kind of information is visual information or textual information and it's delivered on a, let's say, maybe intellectual level, if it reaches the participant through the means that we have historically used in cultural and museum spaces to deliver content, then we are probably not looking at all the possibilities that nowadays we have in the digital era to actually create more space for museum goers and visitors to create their own uh, understanding and maybe a new kind of knowledge. But in that case, if we're giving room for more um, engagement and more processing on the side of the participant, then we are also saying that the kind of knowledge we are delivering and hosting in museums is not as vertical you know, and driven or it's not a one-way street. And in that sense, I was thinking of um, the all different experiential um, contexts that uh, Professor Cheraza was talking about in terms of um, also, you know, cooking or experiencing different kinds of scenarios that can uh, affect our also way of being. And maybe the new direction, if we really want to have a, a also a neuroscience informed understanding of how museum experiences can be. Uh, that calls for a whole rediscussion on what kind of uh, environments we create for the visitors in the museum. I don't know. Yeah, well, if I can respond to the uh, the first the, the 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 first part of that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think what, one of the things that you were saying is uh, <clears throat> that if you if you simply it's it's probably it's a good idea to provide more information to vis museum visitors than simply the title. Uh, of a work of art. That is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that that is the case. But the problem is, if if the extra information that is being imparted uh, seems to the museum visitor to be sim simply consistent and just extending somewhat uh, the sorts of things they already believed about the artist or about the painting, then it's not necessarily going to be particularly memorable. It, it, it may be of some value, but it's not going to be very memorable. Is when you, if, if you understand how the assumptions that most museum makers make, and then you provide additional information that goes against one or more of those assumptions, I think that's uh, that's when it's going to be a memorable experience. So the, the, the main example that I quoted was with with uh, Cezanne and these two-dimensional landscapes. Every time now that I look at a Cezanne landscape, I'm sort of asking myself, is, is, does this fall into that category of being neither particularly two-dimensional nor particularly three-dimensional? So that's completely changed the way that I would look at any Cezanne uh, landscape. And I'm not sure that just providing a bit of information, additional information about an artist and the content of a piece of art, I'm not sure that that would radically change the way they look at that artist's paintings uh, subsequently. Thank you. Uh, I think we can uh, ask uh, Professor Charasa to answer from his perspective, from your perspective. My perspective is different because uh, the neuroscience said that to increase the, uh, the sense of experience uh, and the pro Professor Gaggioli is uh, another uh, is the best uh, scientist in this field of study to increase the uh, sense of uh, experience, uh, to increase the, the, the cognition, to increase the, the to increase the emotional part of experience. We need to move 
motion is uh, directly connected to cognition and, and emotion. Without motion, is is very difficult to increase our uh, sense of experience. Thus, to increase the feeling of uh, of uh, of, uh, of beauty in, uh, during uh, the visiting in uh, the museum, I think that we can work on uh, improving touching improving uh, moving around um, picture and uh, one way could be the virtual reality using virtual reality for increasing the the sensation about my my body and uh, picture and external beauty i don't know see if it can be useful for us okay so thank you thank you very much uh, Professor Isaac, Professor Charasa, for your uh, presentations. Uh, I would, um, you know, bid farewell to both uh, uh, speakers with a second round of applause. So thank you both again. It was such a pleasure to have you here today. And so thank you very much.